If my dad was sick, it wasn't, we weren't going to open. When you're like alone, alone and trying to get into business, it's tough because all the decisions you're making, you're questioning yourself. I couldn't imagine being completely on your own to make all those decisions, you know, every single day. Celebrities came in because they wanted to be there. We never paid for anyone. There's so many moving parts in a restaurant. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Any entrepreneur that we've ever talked to that have made your success, I feel like they're all C students. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Rise podcast with George Abujadi. He is a business person local to Boston. He's awesome with restaurants. He's dropped out of college, a first generation Lebanese guy, grew up in Boston, very humble beginning, started as a promoter and now owns multiple very, very established restaurants and nightclubs. And he's going to be opening up five or six more in the next five years. If you're interested in restaurants, if you're interested in management skills, there's a lot of granular tips here uh, for that. So if you're interested in restaurants, this is the episode for you. Enjoy the podcast. All right, so we have another episode here behind the rise. We have George Abujadi here. Thank you, George, for joining us. We're pumped to get into this conversation. Thanks for having me. I've known George for ten years, 2015. I used to work with him back in the day. Unbelievable guy, family person. Super happy to have you have you come down here in person. I like in person interviews way better than than the Zoom ones. Yeah, personally. no, definitely. I mean, you get you you get the energy in the room. You get to actually like feel the person that's here right. it's, it's a different experience than over zoom you know 100 all right let's get into it so george tell us a little bit about kind of you know where you grew up how you grew up like high school days kind of take us all the way back so i grew up in the uh in the south end in, of boston uh, on shaman ave hmm. um which was kind of like our version of the north end's little italy but it was like little Lebanon, you know, mm -hmm. everybody there was Lebanese, uh, grew up there. Everybody was, you know, my parents were immigrants. My sister was an immigrant. I was born here. Um, language spoken at home was Arabic. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, it was, it was, it was a great little neighborhood to grow up in, you know, everybody go out and call a kid's name out and they come back home. Um, the best. Yeah. It was, yeah. I, I mean, feel like it's lost now. I feel like there's no lost. neighborhoods like that anymore. Yeah. Like real old school, traditional neighborhood feel. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, went to, uh, you know, Catholic school from one to 12, uh, in Boston, um, graduated from St. Clement's in, uh, Somerville, hmm. um, went on and tried college a little bit, you know, didn't yeah. really like it too much. Uh, so I stopped after two years, um, high school, I played, I played baseball, football, basketball, um, whatever sport that the, the school had at the time. Cause archdiocese, you know, had hmm. no money. So they were always dropping, sports or schools you know i went to four different high schools really yeah wow. went four high schools i went to i started off at uh dom savio in east boston yeah when it was all boys uh played football uh it took me way too long to get back home at night hmm. so i transferred to cathedral for the rest of the year uh and then i went to christopher columbus in the north end oh wow uh, which is where i made most of my life you hmm. know lifelong friends there that's where my mother went really yeah that. mom went there Christopher really? Columbus yeah, yeah, High School, right. yeah. She did, right? Yeah, in the North End. And then what kind of student were you? Not good at all. Yeah, welcome no, to the path. Couldn't pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Never passed in any work, never yeah. did any work. You know, so I, I said this in the last episode, because we're, we're C, you're talking to some C students here, so no big deal. But any, yeah. any entrepreneur that we've ever talked to that have made your success, I feel like they're all C students. Most of them, yeah. And most of them, they all say the same thing. They're like, if, if I'm not interested in something like if I'm sitting in the classroom for eight hours or whatever it is, if I'm not interested, I'm not paying attention. But as soon as that person has something of interest, whether it's business, restaurants, whatever their field is, they turn it on and become obsessed. Yeah. Isn't that like a common denominator? We've yeah. Seen? We've seen that with, I would say like nine out of 10 people that we've talked to so far. Right. Yeah. yeah. We, are, we are not good students, but what about your parents? What do they do for work? My father owned a restaurant. So when he came from Lebanon, he, he bought a building in the South End that's currently Copa, which is Ken Oranger's uh, restaurant uh, on Shamad Ave. Cool. And uh, we lived upstairs. My dad had the restaurant downstairs. It opened every day at five. He closed on Sundays. Uh, so, you know, during the day, I'd spend time with him going to Haymarket down in the North End and picking up groceries, you know, in the station wagon. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him. Cause he was the one that could control me. Yeah, and right. uh, my mother was like, you know, get him out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I spent a lot of time with him. So learned the business at a very early age, saw that you were the one that had to do it. That he was, he was, he, he was the chef. My mother was the front of the house. It might've been 80 seats. So, you know, she ran the whole front of the house. She ran the books. He was the chef. He cooked. He did all that. He did all the prep during the whole day. It was just him and my mother. And uh, at night it opened up. 
Um, I washed dishes. I waited, served, bust, did everything. There was just me, my sister. We had a couple people that, you know, were from the neighborhood that were servers uh, in there as well that ended up being our babysitters sometimes too yeah. when they were off. People that you could trust, you know? Yeah. Um, and was it like from, so your whole life it was like that? Or like when you went to high school, he opened it? Or was it like as soon as you, as long as you can remember, he was a restaurant owner? He was a restaurant owner in, in Lebanon. Uh, he uh, owned a restaurant, an ice cream shop, a billiard hall. He owned a few different businesses in, in Lebanon. Um, and then his sister had moved here and she told him to come. It's great. He moved here. Um, and that's, you know, that's when he started. So as soon as it, I was born, he had a restaurant. Hmm. Um, and then until 2000, that's when he retired. He was maybe 77 is when he retired. Wow. You know, what's interesting. It's like, I feel like it would be so difficult. Think about that scenario. You own restaurants in Lebanon. So you, that's your culture. That's your language. Then you come here with no culture, right? Like no language. You don't know the laws and you come here and they're still successful. That to me is insane. Yeah. Well, like because, our dad did that. Yeah. Because they had the work ethic and the drive. And that's really, those are really the two things that you need to be successful here. I think mm -hmm. you don't need to be, you know, like it's the, it's who's most persistent. And who's the hardest worker, who's willing to do what other people don't, are the ones who normally are the ones who have success in the long term, mm. is what I think I found. Right. And you find that in a lot of immigrants, you know, and, and first generation immigrants, you know, like we're first generation like you are. And our, and our parents have a similar story, you know, when they came. But they came here with one thing, and that was like the will to make the American dream, you know? Right. And, it's some, and that's, that's what is beautiful about America, is that if you come here and you have the will to do it and the will to work hard, you can make it where in another, a lot of other countries you can't, you know, right. That's a beautiful thing. So was your dad, so, cause it sounds like your dad was in, was in the back of the house doing all the cooking, like seven days. Was it like a full blown head chef type deal? Yeah. And your yeah. mom was running the front of the house. Yeah. Real old school. Love yeah. That. So you grew up in the business. Mm -hmm. Did you love it or did, were you, or were you just kind of, I like, loved it. You loved it. I right? loved it. Yeah. You, and my dad did everything he could to try to not, let me go into the business. Yeah. Even sold the restaurant before I could take it over, sold the building, did I everything. See. Yeah, I want you to go to school. I want you to be a doctor. I want you to do something. Go open a bunch yeah. of gas stations. Go do something. Don't do this. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I mean, I saw that he went through a lot of, you know, trouble, you know, when he was there. The South End was really changing back then. It was becoming, you know, condos. Uh, you know, there was condos were being sold and, and, you know, parking was getting tighter. So people who used to come in from the suburbs to eat there, you know, would be like coming in and getting a parking ticket and wouldn't come back, you know? Yeah. So, you know, they wouldn't give you valet zones back then. They wouldn't give you a patio back then. They wouldn't do anything for you. And that's when I really started getting involved in it because somebody who lived down the street from us was, um, worked in city hall. So I started speaking to him and I said, you know, I, I started really, I said, you know, I want to start delivery. I want to start, you know, I want to get a valet zone. I want to put some tables and chairs outside. And by that time, my dad had already, decided you know that he was gonna that he wasn't yeah. gonna continue with yeah it. he's gonna get out yeah he, he probably knew that if you know like the life that he had he had to work his ass off from yeah. open to close every friggin day yeah like, like every right that's the story of every restaurant owner and every, every owner says the same thing to their kids like choose any other path there's an easier way to make money it's like blood money to yeah them, you no know? we i think about that even with our kids you know like the restaurant like long long term like you think about it like 15 years from now or 20 years from now do we want them doing what we did, you know, from like the ground up, it's hard. But right. if you can leave them at a different level where it's like they they don't have to start from that bottom up, you know, where they don't have to be in the kitchen or, or in the front of the house, literally open the clothes. That's a different story, but it's a dangerous I don't want that. Game, though. Yeah, it's I don't want that for game. our kids. I'm sure that's the reason why you're good at what you do is because you spent all that. You, you were busting tables, you washed dishes. We kind of had the same path, you know? Yeah. Um, like you, did you learn a lot from that experience as a young kid? I learned, uh, I learned everything, everything right? as far as not relying on anybody else and yeah. doing it yourself. You know, um, if my dad was sick, it wasn't, we weren't going to open. Yeah. You know, so my dad didn't call out sick. Yeah. He was there every day. It was rare that, that, um, you know, his nephew would help out once in a while. His nephew knew how to cook. Um, so there was a little bit of time there when he had some help, but it, it was, it was all about him and, you know, his skin. Yeah, you don't find many managers nowadays. Like even you find people that they've never waited tables, they've never bussed tables, they've never bartended. They've just been managers, mm -hmm. and those people are at a major, major disadvantage. There's things that you don't know if you've never walked in the shoes of a busser, or a server, or a bartender. You can't help them 
the way you could if you've done it before. You know what I mean? And that's 100%. there's a there's a huge gap. The best best managers are the ones that came up exactly the way you did. And to that point, and too, owners, not just managers. Even respect wise, the reason why they have so much respect in the restaurants that they like they're with their staff is they know if someone doesn't show up on the line, Angelo can fill in. If someone doesn't show up on pizza, Lucha can can fill in. If, if someone shows up as, as a bartender waiter, Lucho can fill in. That respect, like it just builds that like unspoken respect. Yeah. That's the danger of leaving the restaurant the way you said. Mm-hmm. You know? Even if you have ten locations and if they've never done it, I mean you gotta hope that you have really, really trusted people. Right, right, exactly. But yeah, we'll get into that. That the whole idea of scaling, going from like one restaurant to two to three, I feel like it's just a whole different game. Like one, it's your baby, you're there all the time. You know, you're like how his dad was, you're just owner operating, you're just all in it all day. But as soon as you start to scale, yeah, it's two, hard to three, break four. That. It's hard to break the the one location mentality. It's like it's like quicksand, you know, like you can't get out of the day to day. Right. Yeah, Which it exactly. took us to get from one to two, it took us like seven or eight years, you know? Exactly. Right. And then even when we went to three and then started like really stepping back in the day to day operations with the staff that you have the existing, you know, it takes a while to get used to it you know and and there was some pushback and everything but once i think you get to that point then it becomes easier like once you break through that original mold like you said if your dad was sick they wouldn't open like you have to that's like that's terrible man you feel trapped it's that's like the slave, worst feeling slave, in the world slave to you your own business i can't take a vacation can't take a day off like that's it's tough it's tough yeah you know all right so now your dad was like don't do it Right, mm-hmm. sold everything, and then you then did it. Right, <laughs> <laughs> like, it kind of went, what yeah, was the because uh, where, where we left is he did two years <clears throat> of school. Yeah, he said fuck this pretty much, and then what was the next step? There? Well, in the meantime, I was working for the Lions Group on Lansdowne Street. Oh yeah, know, that guy's what was that guy's name? Uh, Patrick Lyons. Yeah, yeah. John Lyons, yeah, Mike yeah. Lyons. Yeah, yeah. Those guys are killers. Yeah. So Lansdowne Street, where House of Blues is, used to be Avalon uh, Nightclub, mm-hmm. and I was a promoter there. Um, ran the VIP there. Uh, and they had other nightclubs next door, Embassy, Modern. They had Axis. So I was I was working with them. I learned a lot of the corporate side from working with them. And I had the mom and pop side from my mother and father. Mm-hmm. So putting putting those two things together was was huge for me, you know, and, and learning how to scale, learning how to um, have more than one place and, and not be there uh, 24-7, something I really learned from them. They had maybe 30-something 30, 30 uh liquor licenses in the city at that time restaurants and nightclubs wow so they're a big you know, player crazy. Yeah. fenway back then what, what would you compare fenway back then to now like it was like the place to be it was like the balls maybe Everyone the theater district it was like everything yeah. was there like <clears throat> compact up and down now it's like there's a couple bars and stuff but i don't yeah. think it's packed like it was before yeah no it's not it's, it's not. not it was there was there were a lot i mean it was you know these guys are in their 70s now you yeah. know the lions group um, so they're out of the nightclubs, really. They own House of Blues, you know, mm-hmm. they own, uh, Clink and, and Liberty Hotel, things like that now. Yeah. Um, but, um, there's, there's no area like that anymore. I mean, there's a theater district, which is its own animal. And then you have, you know, even, even Seaport, uh, yeah, it becomes it all, yeah. yeah. So when you mean by promoting, you were just in college, just hustling and bustling people through the door, getting paid per cover. Like, was that kind of how it was? Yeah. So in, in the daytime, I was working at Armani on Newbury Street. So I got to meet a lot of uh, people that I would ordinarily not get, you know, get to meet and, uh, you know, helping them try on suits and helping them, um, you know, get their outfit for the night. So in the meantime, I had always had a stack of cards with me. And for each card back then, you got, you know, you stamp your name on it. You went to Staples and made your name. Yeah. Yeah. You got. Back then, I'm, afraid, I'm embarrassed to say, but you got 50 cents for every person you got in. No. Yeah. 50 <laughs> cents. Yeah. Yeah. Per person. Yeah. <laughs> That's inflation, awesome. baby. I love that inflation, shit. Yeah, yeah. inflation. Yeah. Yeah. We love it as owners now. I'd yeah, love yeah. to give somebody 50 cents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you, but, Biden, for inflation. But holy yeah. shit. And uh, I did my birthday there one night and ended up getting a few hundred people. Ended up getting a dollar. Huge, you know, I think cover charge might have been five with, you know, reduced. It yeah. was 10 and five. Uh, you know, and then they offered me in-house position. I worked in, in marketing with the Lions group for, for maybe 10 years, uh, until, until they started changing direction. And then what age group are you at this time? Like how old to what? Like College, it- um, maybe 20, early twenties, early 30. Wow. So do marketing for them for 10 years. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, just, uh, you know, in the daytime, I was working in retail at nighttime, uh, working in the club, you know, hosting the tables, booking all the tables, 
Um, I even had my own door that they gave me, which is, you know, unheard of. I even checked off my own list. Yeah. Uh, you got paid by your list. Um, was able to check my own IDs. Uh, so wow. they had a lot of, they had a trust. lot of trust in me. Uh, yeah. How was like the ABC commission back then? Was it strict as it is now or? Yeah. But we never dealt with them. I mean, that was just on, you know, the ownership level. Um, yeah. yeah, they were, they were, the ABC was always the ABC cause they're the state, but then you have the the Boston licensing detectives that would yeah, come in. Yeah. Yeah. They were worse then. Back really? Then. Worse. Well, yeah. There was a, there's a certain individual a certain group, back then yeah. that was, uh, they had, had, had out for you. They're very fair right now. You know, they're very fair. I know the detectives very well. They're, they're a great group of guys that, you know, they're, they're there to, you know, just to make sure everything's okay. You know, that you're, you're not serving underage. You're not overcrowding. They're doing their job. They're not out to get you. Some guys will sit there for an hour and just wait to, to see if somebody comes in. Yeah, I think I remember. The, I don't know if it's the same guy, but there was a couple guys when I was bouncing at Whiskey Saigon you know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago that there's this one guy who would just come around. And we're like, dude, this guy's got to catch, catch us a fucking break. Yeah. Go, go do something else, buddy. Mm -hmm. But nightlife has changed so much. Like, when did, when did bottle service even come about? Bottle service came in when I was on Lansdowne Street and in the late 90s. It started off with they had a cart they would push around and they would keep your bottle on the cart. Yeah, yeah. So that was the way they found they found the loophole around bottle service then. And I remember they were discussing it. You know, the Lions group were discussing it. Um, so there would be a girl that came around and had a cart and your bottles would be on it and underneath it with your name on it. And that's how she, she was able to make your drinks at the table. Wow. And then it became, you know, bartenders at every table, bottle girls at every table. Wow, yeah, talking about changing the landscape of nightclubs. Mm -hmm. Without, I can't even imagine a club without like bottle service right now. Yeah, it's yeah. It, when you go, it's just that's what it is. It's like some clubs are the entire la uh, landscape of the club is just bottle tables. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. But so you're there for ten years, and then kind of what made the shift to either get out or to tell us a little bit what happened there. They they brought in a guy from New York who who, and I started hearing that they were going to be you know changing up uh, that they were going to be doing something different with Avalon. Um, so I left and, uh, and I, and I started working with Seth Greenberg yeah. around 2006 at Aria brought me in, made me a managing director at Aria. And, uh, and I took that place over for a year until, uh, Gateman and those guys bought it. Yep. Stayed with them for a couple of years after that. Uh, Do you work with Gateman? I did. I did Gateman wow. and Shiro. I think Gateman bought the building with Lou. Mm -hmm. He owns, he owned that theater. Yep. And. So I worked underneath them for a little while with, you know, the Igor and Heather and Alex. I worked yep. with that group um, for maybe two years or something while I was, I was in the process of opening cafeteria. This is 2007. So I was doing that while I was opening cafeteria. So, but in, when you were working with those other people, you were still in that promoter world, right? Yeah. So just to give uh, like people reference, the city of Boston, in, when it comes to nightlife is very, very small. There's like certain amount of people that kind of own a little bit of everything. Um, so like this, this, it's just a very tight community. Everyone knows one another. So it seems like you were working with people that, that you've known for, for a while in the space. Yeah. And then, then you started, you said you got into opening cafeteria. So how did that even come about? How'd you go from, okay, I'm going to work for these guys. I'm going to you know bring people through the door and all this stuff to then say, you know what, I'm going to open up my own restaurant. How did that transition happen? So how it started and how it ended up was very different. Um, a good friend of mine back then, uh, so Armani Cafe was closing right where Zara is now. It used to be Emporio Armani there, the store, mm -hmm. and Zara on the first floor uh, was Armani Cafe. It was a Giorgio Armani Cafe. It was beautiful. It was a place to be. It's where any promoter during the day had to be there. You had to have a table, 100-seat patio, wow. Ferraris, Porsches, everything, mm. biggest valet zone on Newbury Street. Uh, all the European students were there. Um, they were closing and the space where Eva is now cafeteria space became available. Um, a friend of mine's uncle bought the building and we made a play for the, for the space. And I was originally, you know, a 5% owner there. Uh, after two years of the place almost closing, Ooh. it became 51% owner removed. Everybody made all the changes I needed to do, returned the investment to the investors and went, went on. Uh, until uh, it went on until the pandemic, and then we re reopened after the pandemic, and then closed. All right, so there's kind of a lot to unpack there. So I remember because I, I can relate a lot to George because I was a promoter for a long time. And when you're a promoter, 
you start to like, there's a point when you're in promoting and bringing people through the door, like, oh, wait a minute, I have a lot of value here. You get to a point where like, wow, I'm bringing three, 400 people a night to this place. Then you start to think, I'm not sure if this happened to you, but like, what if I just open my own? And I remember I had that, that dialogue in myself all the time. It's like, what if I just open my own? I, I, I have all the athletes. I have all the celebrities. Like maybe if I open up my own, it would be pretty popping. Did you have that? kind of cycle going through your head while working with these other guys? Well, what happened after I left the Lions group and uh, I think maybe during the time I was with Seth at Aria, I, I had some some friends of mine that I confided in. And I sat down with them and I said, you know, what's the next step? You know, mm -hmm. they said, well, you're, you're kind of at, at the top of, you, you know, promoting right now, you're, you know, and you're never going to become an owner. So, you know, either you change industries or you just, you move, you know, to Miami. My friends opened a place in Miami. They said, you can move here with us. Um, and that kind of stuck with me when they said, you're never going to become an owner. Like, oh shit. And I was like, you know, I didn't have the athletes. I did have the foreign investors though. I did have a lot of people from the middle East uh, in Europe that had gone to school in Boston that I would never have been able to meet if I wasn't in, you know, working at Armani or, or in the nightclub at night, having, you know, access to the tables. Um, I wouldn't have been able to meet them. They were at Harvard, you know, they were, you know, a different level than where I grew up on Shamad Ave. These were mm. kids, you know, the sons of heads of states of other countries who I ended up moving forward with and, and they ended up investing with me. And that conversation that you had, was that like with mentors? Like, do you, do you, do you consider those people like mentors at the time? They were peers. They were peers. Like best friends of mine. Yeah. Because that's important, right? To have those, whether it's a mentor or peers you can confide in. Because mm -hmm. some people don't have that. Yeah. You know, like some people can't bounce an idea or get just true opinions on something. Because when you're like alone, alone, and trying to get into business, it's tough because all the decisions you're making, you're questioning yourself. Hundred like percent. Is, is this right? Am I doing the right thing? But if you have people like a mentor, especially, but even peers, like you said, that you actually trust what they're saying, and you know they're going to give you like true, honest feedback. They're not just going to like bullshit you to get what you hear. That's so fucking important. Yeah, that's been a that's been a huge benefit of us us three. You know, but there's never a conversation that doesn't go through all three of us. You know, so we're right. always. You always feel pretty good about any decision that we make as a group. Dad used to say that all the time. He's like, you guys have no idea how important it is that you guys can talk to each other. Right. You know, like he, cause he did it alone. So he really got a front row seat about, you know, not being able to talk to people that you could trust. Right. So that's great that you found that early on. Yeah. That yeah. That's something I always envied. I have a lot of friends that have brothers and, and, you know, I just always thought if I had a brother, I'd take over the city, you know, have somebody right. that I can trust. That's not going to stab me in the back. Right. Um, there were people that I treated like brothers that, didn't end up being that way, but you know, yeah. I, I watch you guys, I watch what you've done with, with your, with your meal um, plan system and um, everything that you guys are doing. I envy it. It's amazing. It's great. And, you know, this, this, you have three, there's three brothers. Yeah. Well, nothing could be better than that. You know, it's a common yeah, no, thing. I, I'm super grateful <laughs> yeah, for we, it. Like it, I couldn't imagine being completely on, on your own to make all those decisions, you know, every single day. So, I mean, having yeah. it, it's like, I don't know, I don't know any other way, but I look around and I'm like, man, this would be yeah. very, very difficult. So solo entrepreneurship it. is a whole different boat. Cause we talk to a lot of people who ask this advice on business and stuff. And as soon as I hear that they're alone and they, and you start to voice out their concerns and what they're going through, a lot of it's like, you need a partner. Yeah. You need someone to, to balance your thought process. And for us, we've never, I, I'm the only one who actually had a partner outside of the family uh, before. Um, and I dealt with a bad partnership. And that was when I was like, oh, shit, there's a lot of value in families. Like, yeah, do I want to slit Angel's throat half the time? For sure. But well, why me? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but at the end of the day, like there's no hidden agendas. Like Angel's agenda is the same as mine. And Lucho's agenda is the same as mine. Like we're all going in the right path. So even if he doesn't agree with me, I know his intention is in the right place. Sometimes when you partner with other people, you don't know what their intention is. Yeah. You know, their intention could be they have a back end deal with someone else doing something shady or that money siphon like there's so much you don't know but if you really trust like your partner right like there's there's no yeah. hidden your interests need to be fully aligned right we've yeah. learned that and it's like if, if it's just everyone's doing the best they can for their own situation you know what right. i mean so it's you can't even hold it against some people but they just have other interests um so i think the best partnerships is like the more aligned you could be the better off you are right you know cool yeah. right, so back to the story so because it's interesting so you went from Okay, there's a place that's available. My friend's uncle owns a building. Let's get in there. But you start at 3%. So how did that kind of come about? So these other, were there other owners who were saying, like, we want majority and you just bring in the people? No, I think I was the last, uh, I was the last piece of the puzzle. And I they see. had found some investors. And a lot of investors, um, 
some investors had backed out, left a little bit of space, and then just through capital calls um, that I was able to gain, you know, more of the majority uh, mm -hmm. of the equity. And then it got to a part where it was doing not as it was supposed to do, and you came in and got 51%. How yeah. did that happen? Uh, two years of the restaurant almost closing, mm -hmm. not, uh, you know, no, um, no concept of how to run a restaurant. Sure. Um, and, you know, the patio's there, 100 seats in the summer. And as soon as it went away, there was they didn't these people that were in charge of it didn't have a savings plan, they didn't have a plan. So it, you know, you go from um full blown, you know, packed restaurant to, you know, a little bit couple people. Yeah. So and, to to give the, the listener some some kind of idea of where this is. So this restaurant is in Newberry Street in Boston. If you're familiar with Boston, Newberry Street in the summer is banged the fuck out. Can't get in there, lines crazy. But in the winter, it's almost seasonal, right? In the winter, it gets a little slower and duller. So basically, they were packed in the summers, but in the, they just couldn't handle the off seasons. They didn't know how to handle it. They didn't. They didn't know how to. Uh, they didn't do any projections. They didn't budget. They didn't forecast. You know, there was there was no. Uh, they didn't market it as an event space. You know, um, back then, Back Bay was huge. You know, there was no seaport. It didn't exist. Mm. So you didn't compete with anybody. Um, so you know, as soon as you start marketing it. All the hotels were in the back bay. There's tons of hotels there. There's the Heinz Auditorium. Mm -hmm. the Heinz Convention Center was the only convention center in the city at that time. Um, they just left a lot of money on the table. And, uh, when, you know, you, can, you, you learn how to capitalize um, very quickly. So when they were struggling, you, you, kind of, you kind of knew what the plan would be if you were to take over, right? I, I knew all along, yeah, and like they just the, weren't listening. I see. Mm -hmm. So then when the opportunity came to, you know, take over you know, then you, you knew kind of what, how exactly how you wanted to execute on that. Yeah. Yeah. To fix some of the issues. Perfect. Yeah. Cause it's, I feel like this with the restaurants and stuff like that, there's always just a couple tweaks that can make all the difference. Like the small things that matter, whether it's like, Oh, clearly we just didn't market to the right hotel or people that are here. Like, let's see if we can talk to the concierge mm -hmm. or a service change. Like, you know, t talking about the specials, how to upcharge. Like it's always the small things in restaurants that make the huge difference. Yeah. Right. As long as you you have the right location. I mean, you can't outwork a bad location sometimes, you know, yeah. but that location was clearly prime time. It was just having a strategy to deal with. Sounds like in the winter time, because in the summer they were doing, they were, they were killing it mm -hmm. just in the winter. How do you, how do you manage that? But that was good insight from him. Cause he had the experience and kind of how to do it, you know? Cool. So what was your strategy? Like what was, what was year one look like when you had the 51%? Um, it was, um, just, you know, watch, I mean, it was, it's all about the numbers, you know, you can have six, seven people in the kitchen, uh, in the summertime and you have 150, 200 people in the restaurant and in the wintertime right now, I probably have two people back there, but it's having a conversation with them before that happens yeah. and not just making cuts. It's, it's the forecasting, yeah. right. And, and it's, and having the foresight to come to them and say, listen, you know, everybody in the kitchen has two jobs in the daytime until three, they work for you. And then three to close, they work at another restaurant. Mm-hmm. That's the life of people yeah. that are in the kitchen. Uh, so you, you tell them, listen, if you have any hours you can pick up at another place, pick them up until springtime and, you know, we'll give you two days, three days a week. And then, you know, you bring them back in, 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 uh, in the busier season. But it's, it's, it's just, you know, it, telling the kitchen exactly how much they can spend for the week um, and, and managing. Um, it's just really all I do is I manage the managers and I, and I just, you know, we go over the numbers with them every week. Um, and it's more about the forecast because you don't want to, you don't want to get the monthly P and L and say, well, this is what we did wrong. You want to get ahead of it. Right. You say, this is, it's, it's the strategy. Yeah. It's the forecast. And, and that's where you want to be. It, it's, you know, you got six grand to spend this week. That's all you can spend in the kitchen. So unless we have an event that comes up out of nowhere, if you go to, you know, 6,100, there's, there's yeah. going to be a problem. So you're looking at the sales that you think you're going to do this week based on what you did last year. Right. There's so much you could spend plus based on the trend or whatever. You give them that budget and you work through budgets. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a big one. We talk about budget forecast. It's, it's hard to do, man. It's really hard to get everybody aligned on the same page, like to get a chef that understands, you know, forecasting and numbers. A lot of times we've ran into chefs that all they care about is the food and the food costs. And then some only care about labor and labor costs. And it's to find ones that care about all of it and they understand all of it. It's really hard. And then the same thing with the front of the house too. So to get... There's so many moving parts in a restaurant. It's it's crazy. So I have a immense respect for being able to corral all that um, and handle a seasonal place because our restaurants aren't seasonal. 
Um, so adding that layer of staffing and changing all the time, it's that makes it a tough, tough. And Boston's interesting. People don't realize how the population shifts when school is not there. So like the winters, if they're off. So like, I don't know what the exact percentage, but a lot of the, the city's revenue is coming from these students. It's like the most, I think it's one of the most populated college cities in the, in, in the country. Yeah. So in the summers and in the winter, like the population majorly shifts, mm -hmm. which means restaurants, like regulars and stuff majorly shift. And that goes with nightclubs too. I'm like, when I was, when I was in it, the winters were so fucking slow. And all of a sudden when everyone, all the kids came back, packed. Same thing with the fall. Yeah. Well, to his point, that's why the forecasting is right. super important. Yeah. Managing your cash flow. Yeah. We got to get better at that. We, we like at, at the, for, yeah. at the forecasting part, even with our restaurants, like we're, I think we're a little too reactionary sometimes because we're, we don't have the seasonal shifts as much. So we're not as, we don't focus as much on the forecasting rather than we just try to keep our costs at a certain level throughout the year. But I think we got to do a better job on like, okay, January, this is what we're looking at. February, this is what we're looking yeah. at. March. And really, and really laying out a budget for them, you know, rather than saying, okay, we went, we had 36% food costs last month. It's too late. We already, we already lost, you know, but, uh, in the restaurant, if you take your eyes off the, off of the numbers for like a quarter, that quarter, you can go from, you should have made, you know, X amount and you made nothing. You actually lost, you know, because you weren't, you didn't have your eye on it. It's I have crazy. A question for you. So how, how involved are your chefs and managers in like the PNL? Are you doing that weekly? monthly yeah. like they see the numbers every week every week every okay. week yeah they have access you know they can go on toast anytime and see you know you can go in right now and see how many people are punched in uh, what the labor cost looks like um that's why i mean that's why something having the right uh you know um platform is really really important you may pay a little bit more for toast yeah but you're, you're really killer. getting everything yeah we have toast at all our places. it's great yeah, yeah. i mean we, we switched it to toast everywhere and you, you can, you can really manage your business. Just, you know, you can see your food costs, mm -hmm. your, your labor costs, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it's really important um, to have them involved, to have the chef involved, you know, sitting in the weekly meeting, say, this is, this is what you're going to spend this week. And this is, you know, this is what we did last year. This is our forecast for this year. Um, similar winter, similar weather pattern. So, you know, we're not looking at, you know, making up for any blizzards from last year. So you tell them this is, this is, you know, this is what it is yeah. and, and to dial it back a little bit, you know, and dial the kitchen back a little bit, dial the staff back, not to the point where you're killing them, you know, but you understand it is, you know, how many stations there are, you know, how many orders you're doing. You're only, you're not, you know, you're not doing a lot of money in the winter, you yeah. know? So it's a matter of, you know, you want to keep your job because we want to keep the restaurant open. Yeah. It's that, it's that severe, you know, and you yeah. want to have when the patio days are going so strong. You want to put in a few months of reserve, right? Yeah. That's that's the key. Uh, for I mean, it's like having a having a restaurant in Martha's Vineyard. You know, it's like right now it's 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 the same season. Nobody's lining the door. You know, the streets on Newbury Street right now. Yeah. So you got to make sure you're budgeting and putting putting some money away for the winters to make sure that you can cover, yeah. have everything covered. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's people surprise you too once you once they understand why you're doing certain things, how they can contribute to it which we've found recently. Like we've recently gotten more into the numbers with the managers and the chefs and stuff. And it's like, oh, okay, once you see it and you truly understand it, because in the past, it's usually just been us knowing the numbers and we just will pass it down, have meetings to listen, we need to cut the food costs, this and that. But when the, you could see it on paper and they're looking at it consistently. Where do I get it? Yeah, you, when, you know, seeing is believing or whatever. When you fully understand something, it kind of changes the trajectory and people are buying in. Hmm. So yeah, it's not just like so you're telling them. Something. Are, you, are you using so you're you're able to track your food costs through Toast? No, we use Margins Edge okay. for uh, for food for the costs. Food part, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, toast we just use for labor. Um, yeah, yeah. But you can see your your food sales and all that shit yes. through Toast, yep. and you compare it to your cost through through another platform. And it's great. They give you a great mixer report too. You yep. get to see what's selling, what's not selling, um, and you can you can you know you can restructure your menu that way if you have to. You know. Yeah. Exactly yeah so so cool so then so that went that caf cafeteria mm -hmm. before i went and changed it to eva so then what was the next venture because i know you have a bunch of different things what was the next venture the next one was bijou got it and tell me about that so now you were going back to like your I wouldn't say your roots your roots are more restaurant but more your we've been pat doing in the past 10 years which is promoting and bringing people to the door yeah so then you started bijou yeah so how'd that come about so that came about um again there was um 
some people that, that had the location that approached me and a friend of mine who's my investor uh, and said, you know, we're looking for an investor in this project. Uh, the building was uh, really bad shape. I mean, the walls were separating from mm. the it bad, was, bad. It was it was bad. It was the building was going to collapse. So a lot of the money went into restructuring and shoring up the building. It was all it was structurally unsound. So they had that red X outside, you know, the, the white X in the red mm. square. Um, it was it was a nightmare. Um, took years to to build, um, and you know, raising equity. Um, it was tough, right? Raise, raising money for it. it was all private investor. Um, was it one or multiple? In the beginning, there was multiple, and when it when the price started going up the investors started falling off. Mm. So it became one investor. Um, and that's when we took it over completely and, you know, just saw it through. It wasn't originally just like cafeteria. It wasn't supposed to be ours. A hundred percent. It was supposed to be an investment. And I was supposed to look after the investment for my friend. And, uh, and it just, it didn't end up that way. Yeah, so then interesting. So you had an investor who was like, Hey, I want to do this. Yep. You had the space. You're like, Hey, I'll do it. And I'll make sure this is successful. And then, it just more shit happened. You're like, okay, I got to run this thing. I got to operate it. That's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. That's kind of a lot. Cause it was a huge, it's yeah, a huge what, deal. But you know, what did you see in that location that was worth all that, you know, shoring up the building and all that stuff? Was there something about that location that you thought could be successful? Yeah. The location, the, the, the location. location, the neighborhood, the theater yeah. district, you know, all the nightclubs were in this area at this time. Yeah. You know, everything was focused uh, on the theater district at this time. Yeah. See, Bijou has been around for a while. See, what, what, Since okay. what year was that? That was 2011. Okay, so in a, in a nightclub to be around, like be that hot for that many years is, is but something. It, but there was a lot, nightclubs are interesting because there's a lot of shift. Like you could have a lot of euros for five or six years and all of a sudden it changes to more hip hop, then it goes more EDM. Like there's a lot of ebb and flow. And I remember because I, I worked for Bijou for a long time. And uh, it's I, when I first got into it, 2015, it was like the place to be. Like you could not get in. Kids were, and at the time, I remember tables were spending tons of money. It was like two grand a table. I was like, what the fuck is going on here? Mm-hmm. Everywhere else was like $600, 350 and they had these crazy spends and euros were going nuts. So my question was, and I always wondered, w- w- was there a gap in the market when you opened Bijou? Like, okay, there's not enough euro places or whatever. Was there a gap that you were trying to fill or was it just like I came across this and opened? I think it was just, you know, it was, it was rumor and venue at the time. And they had the Euro market cornered. It was, you know, when Aria was around, it was Aria, Venue, Rumor. Venue's been around for maybe 20 years now, right? I mean, um, and then when we came along, um, Kevin and Mete came along from Rumor and Venue, and they became partners at Bijou. And so they were the, the real driving force between, uh, behind uh, bringing the Euro crowd to Bijou Thursday and Saturdays. Which was a huge yeah. milestone. Like, Bijou, I remember, it was Thursdays and Saturdays. Don't bother mm-hmm. unless you're trying to spend a billion dollars. And you know, like good-looking girls, it was, it was like the place. So keep going. Yeah. So so um, you know, for, we didn't want to do it every night. So we didn't we didn't want the you know they get bored of the same place fast. Hundred percent. And then when people start deciding where they want to go, that's when it's dangerous. So mm-hmm. you have to decide when they want to come. So on Friday night we had deep house music, and only very few of the European uh, crowd would really like and appreciate the type of music we were doing on Fridays. So. Thursday and Saturday, we brought them Friday. They were still able to go to, to venue, um, to their night at, uh, at venue. Um, and you just have to really capture them. And, and a lot of their, you know, you're meeting, now you're meeting a lot of kids that you hung out with their parents. That's mm-hmm. crazy. Walid was telling me about that. That yeah. is crazy. They call you up and they say, listen, my son's going, my daughter's going, make sure you take care of them. They're in town. My nephew, you know, my best friend's kid. And so you really pass in, it used to be my little brothers come in mm-hmm. and now it's my kids coming. That's bizarre. <laughs> so how does that feel? Does that make you feel nice and young? <sighs> no, good. <laughs> That's crazy. It's amazing because yeah. you get to, you know, they look up to you, they call you uncle and I'm like, don't do that in public. You yeah. Know? yeah. And you know, in Arabic, it's a big thing. You know, when you're, when you're older, um, you know, a lot of these kids will come from the middle East and, and it's huge to them because my, you know, they won't even party in front of you. And I'm like, listen, just go do your thing. Just don't mm-hmm. get hurt at the right. end of the night. Let me make sure you get home. I know what you're going to do. Have fun, but mm-hmm. be responsible. Right. right. So it's almost like they don't want to party in, in your place because they think that it's going to get back to their parents. Oh yeah. It's you interesting. Know? And then their parents call you and they say, listen, they're going to do what we did. We know. 
Yeah. Just make sure they, they get back home. And they do safely. So many times you put them in an Uber. Thank God. Now there's Ubers compared to taxis back then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you couldn't find a taxi if your life depended on it. Now you call five Ubers a night just to get people home, you know, and, and rarely are people driving anymore, which is great. Yeah. So much safer than it used to be back then. So the interesting thing with nightclubs that I, when I was in it was each night, it's like its own business. So like when you look at like Thursday night, the landscape of how you promote, how you market is completely different than like he said on a Friday night or a Saturday night. Each night, it's like its own micro business. Hmm. Cause it's like, okay, on Thursday night, I'm, this is what the landscape looks like. This is what we need to compete with. This is the music. People don't realize, I mean, you could talk more about it, but the nightclub business is a, is a, a, it's a tough business, but B it's, it takes a lot of creativity to sustain it, especially for a decade or hmm. over a decade. It's to think that it's been around since 2011 is crazy. Hmm. To sustain popularity in all those shifts between millennials, Gen Zs, and all that, it's nuts. I remember Bijou Sundays was a thing, right? That's when I did it. Yeah. I started that with, uh, yeah. Yeah, I did that for a bit. And we focused more on, on artists and stuff. Yeah. But t- So talk to me about how did you sustain, let's say the first, because 20 years is a long, long range. But let's say the first like five years. What was the landscape of Bijou like? So with Bijou, I mean, with any nightclub, you really, you can't ever just say, you know, I'm done. I opened, right? You, you got to constantly reinvent yourself. Mm-hmm. There's so much competition. I mean, forget about even bringing Big Night into the conversation Oof, right yeah, now. Crazy. I mean, that's a whole nother animal. So back then you're, you're competing against Venue, Rumor, Icon now, you know, uh, Cure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we started off, we didn't have, there wasn't one LED wall at Bijou. There wasn't one. And it was, it was two-tone. It was black and gray. I mean, I look at pictures of when we no, opened and I'm like, it looks like, you know, like city hall or something. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We bought one led wall behind the DJ. Waleed lead would literally be on the phone with China when mm-hmm. everybody's sleeping because of the time difference, working on deals to get led panels to line another part of the wall. And then another part of the wall, we keep reinvesting in it slowly. The whole place is covered in led panels. Now it didn't happen overnight. It definitely didn't happen when we opened. It was, you know, we had an amazing sound system right off the bat that we put the money into that, uh, the design. Um, but if you're not constantly, you know, if you think you're cool and it's just going to be that way, just because of you, it's not this, oh, somebody else is opening up. We had to deal with the grand opening, which mm-hmm. is a beast, it's a phenomenal nightclub, amazing ownership. You know, um, we had to keep, uh, keep our, our position in the market, you know, keep reinvesting and bringing in, you know, a lot of the people that we brought in, uh, celebrities, came in because they wanted to be there. We never paid for anyone. I remember. This is all Waleed's relationships, mm-hmm. right? So other places would be paying them or paying their management, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. They came in because they wanted to be there. Travis Scott would come just because he wanted to be there. These, LeBron, these celebrities. James, Drake, crazy. Drake, I mean, they all, we it, you never had to pay anybody, you know? So the kind of the market got really ruined when people started paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for these people to show up to their establishment. We had them there because we were, we're relationship based is what we always said. We were relationship based. I was at the door every single night. I was always outside for a couple of reasons to watch the crowd, watch the IDs and to greet people because that's where I started off. And I was always at the door where there's rain, uh, snow, hundred degrees in August. I love to be outside. I like to see what was happening. And then when inside started filling up, then I'd go inside and start seeing what was going on. But it was really important for me to, to be outside on the sidewalk just to see what was coming in, you know, who maybe needed to get turned away. Maybe somebody was having, you know, had already a few drinks before they came in. I wanted to see everybody before they came in. That's a, that's a good tip because when you're in a busy market, like clubs and restaurants, people want to text a George, a Walid, a Kevin or a Matt to understand they're going to take care of them. That's what created that regular and that regular ended up turning into Bijou's brand. Because now you have to think Grand and all these other places that are open, like they're huge money places, right? Massive lights, all this, but they can never pay or replicate a George or a Walid or a Mete or a Kevin because no one could ever treat anyone better than they did. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So that almost created that brand. And then that's just domino, domino, domino. So if I know a couple people coming into Boston, Hey, I'm going to go to the grand. I'm like, no, 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 don't go to the grand. I'm going to give you Waleed, George or Kevin or Mete's number. You go there. They're going to take care of you. And that's, I feel like how, I mean, this is from my perspective, not yours. That's how I figured like Bijou is a, uh, it's like a a homegrown boutique feel that people like want to be seen at. 
that's not like mainstream like grand does that make sense mm-hmm. yeah that, that was like kind of my vibe with it at least yeah. that's how we treated it that's yeah. that's what it was and it was a customer experience it's just texting like a major d that's why you know what's funny when, when you think about boston people going to restaurants people go to the same like six restaurants there's so many restaurants but i feel like people only go to like the six or ten that are popular i think it's because you could just text like i could text you if i want to go to committee or i could text uh, I don't know, Joey Divasquale if I want to go in the North End. You know, like that quick text makes it so much easier. And I feel like that's just what drives all the traffic. Yeah, and you feel like you know somebody there, they're going to take care of you. That That's a huge part of it. Yeah, I mean, that's Nick, Nick Rano talks about all the time. Yeah. Like he, his entire business was based off that. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay, so the nightclub business, right? Are you in other nightclubs too, or was that? was that? No, so I was at Bijou until June. I've So I've since left Bijou. Yeah. Um. I was not at any other nightclub. No, I yeah. only had Bijou um, and uh, no, that's it. Yeah. How did that, how do you think that Bijou helped your relationships or helped like your business? Like, did you, how, what did you learn from Bijou? I guess like from that tenure, cause it's a long time. I mean, you learn how to swim. Yeah. You know, it was at a position, uh, it got so busy so fast. We got so popular so fast. It was, it was, uh, it was, it was a lot. It was intense. And you had to learn how to be everything. You had to, you know, put every hat on. Mete DJ. Mete's an owner. You know, he was Kevin. He's a good DJ too. He's an amazing DJ. Yeah, yeah he just stopped recently, and yeah. uh, he did it because he loved it. You know, um, but he could see the entire room. He could see what's happening in the whole room from the DJ booth. You know, talk about how important it is to be to the the room of a DJ. Like if, when you have a and when you have a shitty DJ compared to a good DJ and you could have the same people in those rooms, the, the change of the night experience is so dramatic, isn't it? Huge. It's yeah. crazy. And that's why you see a lot of restaurants now having DJs, Yeah, you know, and it's, it's, you get to, you, I mean, you can, you're a conductor, you get to tell the room how it's going to be. And mm-hmm. then you can feel the room and, and, you know, when you're just putting it on Spotify and you p- press play and you're going, you know, pay the extra four five hundred dollars. Have a DJ there for the night. We have it at, at committee now, Friday and Saturdays regularly. We didn't do that in the in the past, but he can gauge the room and and he can go with the feel that he sees and the crowd that he sees. Hugh, we have DJs in every room, um, supper club style. You know, and uh, during dinner, during dinner, really, yeah, yeah. wow, dude. It's I being when I was in a, I was in a rooms for seven years, and all I would do is just. Same thing. He'd be at the door, and I'd go inside, and I'd just see the room. And if it's a hip hop night, you see the the energy of the room usually is kind of dull. Mm-hmm. You see a lot of people just kind of moving. Then all of a sudden, you have like a reggaeton DJ come in, Bad Bunny over there. You see, or like a bachata, that type of stuff. You start to see dancing and people having more fun. And you're like, whoa. But I'm interested during dinner though, like at a restaurant. Like I understand the nightclub thing, right? Like you have a theme, but like. How does it work during dinner? Now, I haven't been to the restaurant, to yeah. Community or Hue or, or anything, so I don't know, like, the, the vibe of the place, but I can't even wrap my head around, like, even at our restaurants having, like, a DJ during dinner. Like, are they, like, what kind of music are they playing during dinner? Like, like dance music? Or so, like- it, it's just, you know, you still haven't, so either way, you're going to have background music on yeah. in your restaurant. So, around 9 o'clock, the DJ will come on at Committee, yeah. and he'll he'll just start playing more of what, we've been playing yeah and then you know after 10 11 it becomes um it becomes a little busier it becomes more bar oriented there's still food until 12 uh but but the feeling is changing the energy is changing it's it's people are in the seaport people want to uh you know they 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 don't want to just it's not stuffy it's not the old school style restaurant yeah you know a lot of people think DJ and they automatically think bijou or the grand but Mm -hmm. it really is just like that dj is just there to conduct you know the the orchestra and and he's he's shaping the way that the crowd feels yeah and music doesn't necessarily go up that much mm-hmm. but it's just you know it, it, he's he's just really directing the way the the energy is for yeah the night. that's cool and you can see some people instead of it's like a good bartender some people if it's a shitty bartender the one drink and leave it's a good bartender they could have four or five drinks because of the conversation yeah the dj can hold a room let's say like they would leave in 45 minutes to leave in three hours. Right. Because that music is kind of like, like you said, it's orchestrating their mood. Right. So like after field. dinner, they'll go to the bar instead of leave. You yeah, know, exactly. Because the energy is, is up. That's cool. Yeah. That's what I saw at least. Yeah. I love that. So cool. Then how did committee come and play? Committee, um, Bijou, uh, cafeteria committee, we're both doing, um, 
cafeteria and, and, and Bijou were both doing great. So we started looking for a new place. We were thinking of putting cafeteria in the seaport. Um, we had a, we had somebody brought me over to Joe Fallon to meet Joe Fallon, who, who developed most of that area. Um, and he showed me the building that committee is in now. Um, and it was just freshly poured concrete. And he gave me a model of the whole seaport. And he said, this is what it's going to look like. And back then it was only the federal courthouse and empire and Strega. That was it. Everyone talks about that guy. Mm. When they talk about seaport, I feel like he's like the godfather. Mm. I have like this picture in my head of like what he looks like. It's probably completely different, but he's like the godfather of seaport, that guy. Phenomenal. You know, there were so many times that he, he, so after he's very close with Nick Verano, he asked Nick, you know, about me, Nick said, great guy, get him in there, you know, definitely owe, you know, owe that to them. Um, there was a time when I couldn't get the financing right for the space. And Joe Fallon called me and he said, listen, what's going on? You know, this is, this is going to be the space. This is, this is the key to the seaport, this, this location. It's like the heart of I want you to have it. You know, it's a great story. You're from Boston. I want you to have the hottest spot. And he's an older guy, you know, and, and this guy just, he developed, you know, he owned the seaport forever. He owned that area forever. He told me, he's like, I've been paying taxes on this land and the water for 10 years. And, and, uh, you know, he had a vision for it and he kept after me, you know, and, and, you know, because I didn't, I didn't know if it was going to happen and my investor fell through. So then I had to go to my friends and, uh, who, you know, we all scrap, scrape some money together, mortgage my house. Everybody got their money together and we invested, uh, you know, in committee. How do those partnerships, because we never raise money for anything. How does the partnership work? Like, I know a lot of people do like an 80-20 split where the investors have 80% until they get break even, then it switches to 20%. How do you typically do the partnership? There's no, I mean, there's no uh, textbook way. There's no cookie yeah. cutter way. It's it's really what everybody's going to agree to. You know, um, you can say that I want to retain 50% and I'll sell you 50% mm. um, or, you know, 20% or it depends on, I mean, it really depends on who you are and and how much they really want to be involved in the project. Your first project, it was, you know, you might get 5%. Yeah. You know, yeah. Now I'm, I can, I can almost write my own contract, you know, and, and, um, I have something to hang my hat on. I can say, well, this is what I've done. So this is why I want 50, 60, whatever percent, you know, at the next restaurant, uh, or I just want a loan and I want to keep the equity to myself, which is the best thing to do. Right. Yeah. And how do you deal with them? Do they, are there some investors that are just, worse than others or there's some that you just send it to distribution to or are you sending like monthly p ls like i don't even know how does that even work yeah you send monthly financial statements you send them the p ls um and then you know you do your distributions based on when you when it's you know when it's financially you know safe to do it um they're all friends of mine some of them have invested and just walked away they just want their checks they come in they eat mm -hmm. um and others you know, nobody's involved. Everybody's a silent investor, but others like to think they're involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know? That's how it works. Yeah, <laughs> but they're friends, so you just talk to them, and yeah. it's you know, it's it's fine. I mean, everybody wants to be a part of uh, you know something successful, but the minute you're not, the minute it's not busy, yeah, you're like, where are you? Where, yeah, where'd you go? Yeah. I need you to bring people in here. I now. Feel like, now I need you. I feel like restaurants and clubs are like that. Like people want to invest just to be like bring their girlfriend and their friends. Say, oh, I I own some of this place. You know, like I get my fifty percent off or whatever. like you know what I mean. Yeah. I feel like a lot of restaurants and clubs are those type of investors. It is. It is a lot. And you'll get people that, you know, one of my good friends is a major developer and he's like, I'm not even expecting my money back. I'm expecting to lose this. Mm -hmm. And you're like, <laughs> nice and honest. What, what, why would you say yeah. that? Yeah. Thank you lose you it, your, yeah, no, thank you. I want you to make your money back so we can do more. Yeah. You right. know? And they believe in you. They want to do it for you. You know what I mean? I didn't have, I didn't, I, I couldn't have done it without my friends. I couldn't have did it without my investors. I wasn't going to go to the bank, you know, without a house and get a, and get a loan to open a restaurant. So if it wasn't for my friends investing and believing and partnering with me, uh, you know, I wouldn't be where I am. Yeah. So also committee is a major success even today. I mean, that place is absolutely bumping. The food's amazing. And what got you to now Hugh, which is the newest, it used to be a club called Storyville. How'd that come about? So we had looked at that location originally when Brian uh, vacated it. We spoke with uh, uh, the, the, the developer there um, and they just, drag their feet and it was maybe two years uh until rob um robert eugene rob from hennessy brought it to me and said listen we have the money we have the idea we don't have an operator so um rob brought me in to meet the team at the time um 
And, you know, he said, we, we'd like you to be involved and, and, and be the operating side of this place. Um, so I accepted Rob's, you know, this, you know, we just talked about it. There's nobody more genuine than Rob in the city. No, he's the best. Great I, to be partnering with him. He's an unbelievable, genuine, not a bad bone in his body. Not one person can say one bad thing about him. He's just an incredible person. So they brought you in because they're, my, my understanding of Rob, he was a well-known dude. He worked for Hennessy. Um, probably never owned a restaurant. So they brought you in as the, as the operating partner. Yeah, correct. Got it. Okay, cool. So you had to come into this space and pretty much say, okay, the numbers should look like this. The labor should be like this. This is the menu. So did you develop the entire menu? I helped, I helped them develop the menu and hire the staff. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big dynamic over there. You know, there's three rooms as you know, cause it was, mm -hmm. it was your yeah. place for a long time. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, uh, I helped them bring in, you know, we interviewed the chefs, we interviewed management, um, and I helped them out a lot during construction. Cause I was, I was in the middle of construction at Eva at this time that they approached me. And I didn't know if I had time to even give them time, um, be just because opening a new place already. Um, but I managed to do, you know, get Eva open and help them with construction because construction in the city of Boston, you really not, not have to know how to navigate, you know? Uh, and I helped them out a lot with construction and, and, uh, and opening up. Who does, did you help design it too? Or did you guys pay for a third party designer? This, there was a third party designer, but my best friend who's a developer, um, you know, Anthony Rossi, yeah, he, yeah. he, he did all the construction, oh, most nice. of the construction there. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Cause the design's a huge part of the city's restaurants right now. Ambiance. How are you different? Uh, greenery, like just how can you make it as sexy as possible? I feel like right now it's, it's a huge competitive space because everyone's look going to Miami and they're seeing these ridiculous restaurants and they're trying to bring a little bit of that spice to Boston because that's what Boston's missing. So I feel like ambiance and decor and, and just the whole layout is so important. Yeah, exactly. For it, sure. Now, are you doing like meetings with the managers at all these places? Yeah. Like in your, your forecast, help, helping with the forecasting and helping them lay out their budgets and all that stuff? Yeah. So that's like where you're spending your time, like managing the managers, like you so said. I just brought in uh, a director of operations for all my places now. Nice. Um, he was with Columbus Hospitality for 20 years. Oh, wow. Um, Which one's Columbus? So that's Mistral, Moose, yes. Sorolina, yes, yes, yep. Ostra. Uh, he was a director level person with them. And I asked him uh, to come in and partner with me. And, and from here forward, you know, we'll do everything 50-50. He went to Johnson Wells. He has the business side of the restaurant. Um, you know, I, I always told him, my dad told me to stay in school. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. I, I stayed in school, but for restaurants. Yeah, so, not bad. you know, it's Dominic, you know, he's a very welcome uh, person. And, you know, I tell you, the, the only way to, to grow is to give up some control, mm -hmm. yeah. but to the right person, of course, you know, and we have a plan, you know, we want to open five more restaurants. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't going to do it, you know, the way I was before. I wasn't going to do it still being a part of Bijou either, because that place requires you to be there. A lot of work. It yeah. requires a lot of work. Um, you can't, it's tough to scale when a place keeps calling you back mm -hmm. and has, has problems and you got to keep fixing things. Um, but, you know, with Dominic, we were around the same age. We have the same mindset. Uh, we have the same plan moving forward. Uh, it's a blessing having him. So, you know, now I can really, now at this point, I can finally grow the way I want to grow. Yeah. And when did that, did like, was it an aha moment for you where you were like, fuck, I really need like someone to like help push this through. Like my time is so limited. Is that when you figured out, okay, now it's time for me to try to find a partner? Um, yeah, I had somebody that I thought was the person, but he wasn't the person. So I went and, and started speaking. Uh, I started speaking to people, finding out somebody like Dominic was interested in. It was, you know, it was amazing because, you know, 20 years with, with this restaurant group, I, was, I think the best group in the city um, to put the faith into, you know, coming uh, and partnering with me and believing what I was telling them we were going to do, you know, yeah, was huge. A lot. So, yeah, um, I know my limitations and, you know, he fills the voids that, that I don't do perfectly. Right. There's a lot that I, I don't do perfectly. I can do, but he can, he can, he fine tunes them. And instead of learning by, 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 you know, trial and error, mm -hmm. which I, you know, I did a long time ago, he already knows it ahead of time. And so he, instead of instead of the trial and error it, it's this is the way it is you know i feel like a lot of those partnerships what it is is okay i'm this you're that you're gonna i'm yang you're yang let's partner because you're good in that and instead of me taking five years to figure this thing out us together will take a year 
you know, or six months or whatever that is. Cause it's going to instead of me banging my head against the wall, making mistakes for two years. Our partnership is going to just mediate all that bullshit. Yeah. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing about having a good partnership like that. So that's yeah. good. I'm happy you found that. Yeah. Definition is, yeah. is the most important thing in a partnership Yeah, to define your role mm-hmm. and to know your limitations. If you have any limitations to know your weaknesses yeah. and, and your strengths. And I mean, that's, it's the most important thing. Yeah. No, I'm happy. I'm pumped that you found Thank that. Thank you. It's big. Yeah, too. That's like essentially finding like a brother, you know, yeah, like exactly. having a bro- brother involved. Yeah. We kind of have different, the, some of our issues are our, our skills are kind of a little bit at the same to some level, but at the same time different. So that's kind of, I think that's why we've worked together so well because we're, we're different. But the only thing is that we don't have different experiences. All our experiences have been together. Like Tino had the experience with the, nightlife stuff which has been a little bit different but everything we've learned we've learned from shit that we've been doing you know so if we've been doing it wrong so every time we meet somebody like that's why i think we love doing these podcasts because we talk to you and we you know like literally we're asking you questions because you know we're trying to learn you know about forecasting and and all that stuff so this is i love doing this for that reason because we get different perspectives on how to do things you know yeah this podcast became like a a nice hobby because like everyone asks us like what's our hobby we don't have shit we work we go to the gym we come home we don't do shit else so i'm like you know what let's do this and just talk business with other people to me that's a hobby right like, exactly fuck it. we can meet people from miami we talk to them about their business like it's fun it is all right so i think we're kind of running close to time here so at the end of every episode we always ask you know what is we have yeah but yeah before you before you kind of finish up with that what's your like what's the next step george like what's okay i got dominic we're good to go all of our places are established and they feel like it's running properly what's the next step because also to get someone like dominic you need to sell them on a vision and that's huge Mm -hmm. because if someone like that does not jump on board and let's say they believe in you or two they don't they believe in your vision Mm -hmm. so what was the vision that when you were talking to him he was like fuck yeah i'm in um you know it was is definitely to expand um i you know i i don't i don't have a vision of my next place I, i don't know what does it if it's the location or an idea. Sometimes I could find a location and, and I could find a location and I could put a concept together right away. Um, sometimes it's the need for another location, right? Sometimes like at, at cafeteria, everybody had grown and, and they had maxed out. So we needed another place. And so, you know, the more places you get, the more, more confidence, the more, um, you know, the more people believe in you. And it, it's kind of easier to do it, um, to do that because, you can grow a bartender from one place to a bar manager in another place and you know, you can promote people and, and you know, you can grow people and people know that they can grow with you. Right. So Dominic, I, you know, I, I said, listen, you know, I have some ideas. I don't have everything, you know, there's nothing cr- concrete written out. Um, but I want to grow when I need somebody like you to grow the way I want to grow and we'll be 50, 50 moving forward. Sounds like yeah. a good vision to me. Yeah. Cause I know there's a lot of people that I'll take one concept like let's say you have six concepts, but one seems to be more scalable than the other and they'll triple down or 10 X on that one concept. Or some people, like you said, they say, well, I know how to do restaurants. I know how to do concepts. And there's a place here that I think this new concept would work. It yeah. seems like that's more your, your route. Yeah. I have, the, I definitely have the vision, you know, I, I can see a space and I can, I know what's going to go in there. I already, we're already working on a, on a lease for another space right now that we haven't signed yet. Um, and I, and I already know I want to do a nightclub, you know, um, so I know what I want to do when it's going to happen. You know, we'll see. You can't, you can't force it. Right. Mm. But I always envision things. And, um, every time I've envisioned something, I've made it happen, you know, and you, you got to see it, you know, you got to see it first. Yeah. You got to see it first. Everything. What, what about lease terms? <laughs> like, what do you look for in lease terms? Cause what, like, what, what do you look for in lease terms? He deals with all that shit. I don't yeah. Mean. I look for, I look for length of time that we can control it for, at least 10 years, but a way out after like five, for example, I try not to sign personal whenever possible, but that's very difficult sometimes. And then I always look for the rent to be less than 7% of the, the potential revenue. Now we're looking, we're in the restaurant business where food and everything. So it's, I think probably different in nightclubs and stuff like that. I've never done a percentage lease. Um, we've, we've had some landlords want to do a base rent plus a percentage after it hits a certain revenue which I hate. I hate, I personally hate it because it's like, okay, if we hit it here, you know, it's because of the work we did, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the, like the main things that I look for. The, the, the rent to be less than 7% of the projected revenue, um, a way, a way in or out. 
you know, to stay in if it's doing good and, and really have that, you know, 10, at least 10 years mapped out. So after five, if it's doing really good, they don't triple the rent on you and you don't have control of that. Um, and I like to not sign personal whenever possible. So those are like the things I look for other than obviously you need to have the right location. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I started off signing personally because I had nothing yeah. to, you know, to, to show them. Right. But now I'm not signing personally anymore. Um, I have some, I have one rent that's just per square foot. I have one rent that after it hits X, it, there's a percentage that kicks in, but only up until X. Yeah. And I have one that's straight percentage, which you look in and you're like, we had a phenomenal month and now we're writing a huge check. Yeah, exactly. I hate, yeah. So it, it's, you know, it stinks. You kind of want something concrete. Yeah. And you just want to stick with it. You usually do a 10 with a, you know, with an option. Yeah. Um, but the option is yours. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the key. And then do you have your, the, the next 10 years like already laid out, like well, how the increases are going to go? It does. It is. Yeah. yeah. But you know, you never know. Like one of my places is coming up right now, mm -hmm. but it's not, you know, now the pandemic and now there's less offices and now right. there's, so you can have that conversation and to say, it's not it going to be this. Right. It's, you know, this is where the neighborhood is now. This is where we want it to be. Right. Um, and they, they get it. You yeah. know, they know when you could see all the comps, you know, a lot of my friends are in, in commercial real estate. Yeah. You ask for the comps for the neighborhood and you say, well, this is what this person paid. And, you know, TI, you know, everything, everything, yeah. every single deal is different. Every yeah. single deal is different. Yeah. Do, do I mean, I, we haven't done like big landlord leases really. Um, but like TI and all that stuff, we were looking at a place one time that was like a huge landlord. I think Avalon was the, uh, was the landlord. And, um, the, the terms were like crazy. No, it wasn't Avalon. No. It was Toll Brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Toll. It was like a big they, person they wanted, like that. They wanted to grab you by the nuts and bang you in the back. Like they were just didn't give a fuck with their, yeah. with their terms. They wanted you to sign personal kids. Uh, it was crazy. Yeah. So we Sick didn't do building, it. But, but TI can be, I mean, right now landlords want you in their space because you're like a lot of times the anchor tenant that's going to bring people in. And right now they know that the landscape has changed since COVID. And office spaces are gone, like you said, you know? Yeah. So the restaurants are, are driving people into the city more than offices now, you know? So they want a good tenant in there. So they're willing to work with you a little bit, I think, and invest even into TI, you know? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, if, if you're getting a high TI, you're, you're going to end up paying for it. Correct, yeah. You're going to end up, you know, they... They always, they'll, you'll pay a little bit more monthly. Mm -hmm. Either way, you know, they're going to underwrite it, right? Yeah. They're, it's, they're going to figure it out. They're not going to lose money. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, okay. Last question. So what is the best piece of advice that you've either gotten or that you could pass on to the people listening? Uh, honestly, um, have as many meetings as you can sit with as many landlords, as many developers, listen to as many ideas and, and, and really try to envision where you want to be. Uh, if you see it, you know, you can achieve it. Yeah. And and I always envisioned where I am now and I'm envisioning where I want to be in five years and where I want to be in 10 years. And, you know, um, I sat with so many people. I, I was so disappointed when so many deals didn't happen. Yeah. But I look back at it and I, and I know that that was the right, that, that was the right, um, the right thing that happened was not getting that deal yeah. because this deal came forward yeah. or listening to two deals at the same time. Listen to as many people as you can. Like listen to as many, sit with as many, get as many LOIs as you can. You're going to just learn so much from, from it. Yeah. And, and you're going to, you're going to get so much valuable experience that you're not going to, you might not get in school, you know, but sitting with developers, sitting with, you know, old school money, like my guy on, on Newbury street is old school, writes in pen and paper. And then you deal with people that own the vertex building and it's 80 pages, yeah. you know, um, you get so much a uh, uh, different perspective from sitting with different landlords. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Great yeah. advice. All right. That's a wrap. Thanks for watching guys.